are very humble. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to class today. It is going to be a great class. It's already started off fun with talking about what our strengths and weaknesses are. And today we're going to talk about Congress and Congress's strengths and weaknesses. My name is Curry Sodner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I am here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars, who's going to help answer all of our questions around Congress. Remember, put as many questions as you want in the chat. We love to answer your questions too. We'll weave them into the right parts, or if there are questions we haven't thought of, we'd love to share those with everybody. So lots of fun diving into this today. Tom, I pre-gamed you with, there's always a lot of questions to our classes. You now, what is the role of Congress? What powers does Congress have? These classic questions, but I broke it down into two simple, big, giant question buckets. Number one, how does Congress work? Like how stuff works theory of what is Congress's job and how does it work? And number two, why did they build it that way? When we talk about the Constitutional Convention till today, how is Congress defined and why did they, what did they think it would do and why did they build it that way? So all these questions are kind of angled on that, those two answers, how it works and why it's built and functions the way it does. So that's our big starting point. Do you want to dive into where we love to start with the Constitution? Yeah, let's go to the Constitution. And it's a really, really long part of the Constitution. It's the biggest part of the Constitution, Article 1. So to back up, what we always remember is that in the Constitution, the founding generation laid out the branches of government in Articles 1 through 3. Article 1 gives us Congress, the legislative branch. And within the national government, Congress is responsible for making the laws. Now, for the founding generation, they believed that Congress was both the most important and also possibly the most dangerous part of this new national government. And so they wanted to lay out a lot of the details about how it was going to work, what it was going to look like, et cetera. So if we're looking at Article One of the Constitution, what do we see in there? What do we learn? Well, first, it separates Congress into two houses. We call this bicameralism. So Congress is separated between a U.S. House of Representatives which is un organized under the principle of popular sovereignty. So those representatives are elected directly by the people. And then we have a US Senate, which under the original constitution was elected by the state legislatures. And it's, it's organized around the principle of equal state representation. So with the US House of Representatives, uh, we determine the number of representatives each state gets by its population. So the larger the state, like California has more representatives than a small state like Rhode Island. On the other hand, the United States Senate has two senators for each state. So whether you're a huge state like California, a small state like Rhode Island, you get two senators. Now, also in Article 1, we learn a lot about the House and Senate. And I see Curry has the slides up there giving us at least a couple of the other details about them. So the U.S. House of Representatives, it has 435 members right now. Representatives have to be at least 25 years old. They serve for two-year terms. And the big principle here is that the House of Representatives was designed to be the part of government that was closest to the people. The flip side being the U.S. Senate currently has 100 United States senators. They serve for a bit longer than members of the House, so for six years. Every two years, a third of the Senate is up for election. In both the House and the Senate, Members can run for re-election as many times as they want. And finally, the Senate does also play a key role in, other, in certain areas, including foreign policy and things like Supreme Court nominations. Finally, because of the 17th Amendment, we now elect United States senators by the voters. The people themselves select the senators, not the state legislatures as under the original Constitution. So those are the two houses of Congress, Curry. That's awesome. So I, I always found it so confusing. And I know a lot of our younger students and sometimes our older students too, it, yeah, find this. There's like, there's a lot of names under article one. You have, you know, you have Congress and looking at both of those, then you have the house and the Senate and you have two different parts. And we're going to dive into why, why did they build it that way in a little bit? But when we think about how it's broken down and how its job is to represent people, what is the main kind of goal and job and big idea around Congress and around their key role in making law? Yeah, that's a great question, Curry. So, I mean, when the founding generation, we'll get to the convention in a little bit, but just here's, here's the summary. As they're looking at Congress, they're looking really in two different directions. On the one hand, they want to create a new national government that's more powerful than the national government that came before. 
the Articles of Confederation, but they also want a national government of limited powers. And so they're, as they're looking at Congress, the big question they're asking is, what sort of policies do we think really have to be set by the national government versus what really do we want to leave to the states? Because we know for the founding generation, they wanted the states to continue to do a ton. This is our system of federalism where the national government does certain things, the states do certain things. So we have this big question of which powers are we gonna grant Congress? The other one though is there's a deep concern that Congress is gonna to have too much power. That we got rid of this powerful British empire, do we really want now this big and distant Congress in some distant national capital making all decisions for everything? Of course not. And so part of the process there is what did they do? The, the framers decide they're gonna they're gonna break up the power within Congress. They're gonna split it between two houses. So any law that passes, it's gonna to have to get through two houses. And so people today, they complain, oh, nothing gets done in Washington. Congress is gridlocked. Congress can't do anything. There's a certain degree to which that's not a bug. That's a feature of the system. The big theory for the founding generation is we're gonna create a complicated system, one that moves slowly. And what do we wanna derive from that? We want a system that forces deliberation and compromise. We want any ideas that pass, any ideas that are gonna pass as national policy applying in every state in the country, we wanna make sure they're good ideas. We wanna make sure they're well thought out ideas. We wanna make sure they're ideas that can unite people of different views. Because the danger for the founders, especially Madison was, we don't want a national government that's overrun by what he called factions. It's just a fancy word for, we would today say political parties or partisans. Mm. We, don't want the, we don't want policy to be dominated by any one group and the hope is that by slowing the political process down, what we can do is that we can get rid of bad ideas, we can make flawed ideas better, and we can make good ideas truly great. And through this slow process of policymaking, we can create national policy that's gonna promote the common good. That's the big theory at least, Curry. That's really helpful. And I have to, we have a class on Tuesdays that we talk about a lot in this class because it, it kind of reflects what are we teaching there? What are we teaching here? But that is what they got stuck on yesterday. What is the job of making laws that is at the national level? And what is the job of making laws at the state level? Um, and that's where they were, weren't really sure. And now these are college kids. So when we think about it, we, there is a lot of mis mystery and unclarity around the, brand, the first article of the Constitution. This is why we want it to have this week. This is why we dive into it and really get to the nitty gritty. So when you're going, kind of walk us through this process that they do to have a big job that Congress has is to make national laws. So again, and you said it a minute ago, but clarify for everybody, what is a national, what is a law that Congress would be in charge of making? And why does it fall to them and not the state law? And then how does it work to do what you just said? So if the system is set up to slow it down, to make sure it's an iterative process and you get better and better and better, then how do they set it up structurally to slow it down? So walk us through kind of like how a bill becomes a law with those big ideas intertwined there. Yeah, so Curry, the, the, the thing to remember, the big thing to always have in mind with Congress is you always wanna ask the question when a new law is up, uh, you wanna ask, where is Congress getting the power to pass it? Congress is a body of limited powers. And so we're gonna to go to the powers of Congress in a bit, but if you wanna look at them, they're in Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution. So we're always gonna be asking that big question of, does Congress have the power? What sort of powers did we give Congress? Well, some of the most important ones are the power to lay and collect taxes. So we gave Congress a broad taxing power. It didn't have that before under the Articles of Confederation, but under the US Constitution, it did then. Another big power, and one we'll return to many times, is the power to regulate interstate commerce. So this is commerce that happens between states. This is basically Congress's broader power to regulate the economy. This is where when, the con when, when, con when uh, Congress is passing laws that are regulating businesses or how businesses interact with one another, they're usually drawing on their power to regulate commerce. And finally, the last one there you can see at the bottom is the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to carrying out Congress's listed powers. People sometimes call this the elastic clause, but this is where um, Congress is able to do certain things that are necessary, maybe not specifically listed in the constitution, but that are necessary to carry out their other powers. Those are sort of the big things, but the, when the founders are looking at this new constitution and figuring out which powers to give Congress, what they're really asking themselves is, where do we think it's important that we speak with a national voice? Where do we think it's important where there's problems that really should be addressed nationally and therefore setting rules that every state has to follow versus where do we want some variety? 
And where do we want federalism, this, the powers of the states to have some play in the joints to experiment and sometimes just to pursue different policies because they have different goals and different views. And so that balance of power, there's a reason why we find it confusing or mystifying or, or anything like that, because these are the very debates that we had from before the constitution existed all the way up until today. So that's a bit about the powers, now the process, Curry. So, so the first thing we're gonna ask is, does Congress have the power to pass this law? That's one thing we wanna ask ourselves. But then the question is, how does a law, bill become a law to begin with? And so the mechanism here is first, a bill has to be passed by both houses of Congress. Again, this is, that pro, this is bicameralism. And this is the idea that you know, we really do want both the House and the Senate to say yes before anything could possibly become a law. But after that, that's not the end of the process. The bill is then sent to the president and the president can either say yes or no. The president can sign the law or the president can veto the law. So this is a great example of that deep principle of checks and balances. Congress has the power to pass the laws, but the president has the power to say no. If the president says yes, signs the bill, it becomes a law. If the president says no and vetoes that bill, the bill then goes back to Congress. And Congress can then speak back to the president and override the president's veto with a two thirds vote in both houses. This is really, really, really hard to get done. It really <laughs> requires broad support, usually from people of different political views to check the president and override a veto. But if the Congress does successfully override a veto, that bill becomes a law. If it doesn't, then the bill's dead and they start all over again. And then the final part of the process here, Curry, is even after both houses of Congress pass a bill, even after the president signs it, ordinary citizens, groups, businesses, states can go to court and argue that no, that law is unconstitutional. And then we give the courts the power of judicial review, the power to say this bill, this law is constitutional or it's unconstitutional. It's a complicated it's, system. It's, it, yeah, but it, there's lots of loops in there too. There's loops in there that if it's not just dead, there's ways to kind of bring it back around. Can you give a good example of when the president has vetoed a bill and Congress has gotten the two thirds and pushed it through that the students can kind of think of and write in their notes of like, here's an example of one time this happened? Sure. I mean, the most the first time a major piece of legislation was overridden was during Reconstruction. So this is the period after the Civil War. And Congress had passed the first big civil rights bill, to, a bill that was trying to treat especially African-Americans fairly after the end of slavery. It's called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The president vetoed that bill and then Congress overrid it with two thirds majorities in both houses. And so that's how the first big civil rights bill in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 became law. Awesome, that's a great example too, one of my favorites. It feels like a good win. Uh, okay, so why? And you kind of gave us so many good pieces of information there, Tom, in the last part where they, they made it this way because they were scared. They're scared of too much power, but at the same time, they wanted to have more power. So let's go back and kind of jump back to 1787. We weren't worried about who's in this picture because that's not our strength. Um, but we will dive in the debates they had around this and oh, like unpack that a little bit more. They're, they wanna make sure that Congress has enough power to make laws for the new nation all coming together that they knew would be get bigger, but at the same time, were staying in their lane and making laws that were not in the, in the state's business, but in their business and their goals. So can you kind of begin with what were some of the big debates over it? What are the ideas that bubbled up and how did they build what we have today in Article One? Absolutely. So, I mean, Congress, as we said at the beginning, is at the absolute center of the framers' vision of this new national government. And so not surprisingly, the most debated part of the Constitution at the Constitutional Convention was what is Congress going to look like? And so this presented a range of debates over time. Part of it was over the structure of Congress. So, for instance, there, were, there was the question of, you know, it, are we going to have a single House of Congress? That's actually how it worked under the national government before the US Constitution? Or are we gonna divide Congress into two houses? This was an easy question for the delegates. They were really afraid of giving this new Congress a lot of power. And so they wanted to divide that power between two houses of Congress. That's how we get that system of bicameralism, a US House and a US Senate. Then they had this big, big debate over whether to set the number of representatives for each state by population or by equal representation. This is, this is the debate that pit uh, James Madison's Virginia plan 
which said that in both houses of Congress, we want the number of representatives for each state to be set by population. So that means more populous states like Virginia gets more, they would get more representatives in Congress than smaller states like Rhode Island. The flip side is then that William Patterson comes out with the New Jersey plan, which says, no, 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 no. That's not the way Congress has ever worked. It's not the way it worked under the Articles of Confederation. We, the small states, are not going to stand that. And so we need equal representation for the states in Congress for the system to work. Meaning if, it, if you're a huge state like Virginia or a small state like Rhode Island, everyone should get the same number of representatives. In the end, they broker, the delegates broker what's known as the Great or Connecticut Compromise. It's brought together by Roger Sherman. And it's how we get the system that we have today, where we have a US House organized by population and a US Senate organized by equal state representation. This is a debate that almost tore the convention apart where people were ready to leave the convention because they had a really tough time figuring out how to reach a compromise. But in the end, Roger Sherman brokers this compromise and it passes by a single vote. So those are a couple, those are, those are two big debates over the structure of Congress. The last big one was, how do we count enslaved people for the purposes of representation? And so we know that the US House of Representatives, it's the number of representatives is set by population in the state. What do we do with the enslaved populations, especially in those slaveholding states in the South? Pro-slavery Southern delegates say we should count enslaved people as five fifths of a person, as a full person for purposes of representation. This would boost the power of the slaveholding states, even though they would do nothing to vindicate the rights of enslaved people. The flip side is that you had anti-slavery Northern saying, no, 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 that's hypocritical. You give enslaved people no rights, you treat them in a brutal fashion. It's a moral sin what you're doing in these slaveholding states. And so as a result, we certainly shouldn't count enslaved people for five zips and boost the slaveholding state's political power. In the end, we see another compromise at the convention, the three-fifths compromise, also brokered in many ways by Roger Sherman, where the delegates ultimately say enslaved people will count as three-fifths of a person for purposes of representation in the U.S. House. That's the three-fifths compromise. And then finally, Curry, that's the structure. There's also then this big debate over which powers do we want to give Congress? And so what we have in Madison, James Madison's Virginia plan, so the Virginia plan Madison uh, offers to the convention at the beginning, and it's, it's in a way structures a lot of the debates that come afterwards. Uh, Madison, it's largely his brainchild. It's introduced by his colleague, Edmund Randolph. But what it does in, 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 uh, in uh, regard to Congress is it states a broad principle of what we want Congress's powers to look like. It says that we want Congress to, quote, legislate in all cases to which the states are separately incompetent or in which the harmony of the United States may be interrupted by the exercise of individual legislation. What this really boils down to is that we really want Congress to be able to address genuinely national problems. We don't want Congress to do everything, but what we wanna be able to do is identify the areas in which we think it's important to set a national policy. And so this is the big principle, the convention passes a resolution saying, yeah, yeah that's a good idea. And so two months into the convention, they send it to a committee called the Committee of detail, which is then tasked with writing the first draft of the Constitution, which we actually have at the Constitution Center. It's so cool. It's in James Wilson. You can see him in the upper right hand uh, uh, part of the screen there. It's in his handwriting. It's such a cool thing to look at. But the Committee of Detail takes this broad principle that the convention passes, which basically says Congress needs to legislate on genuinely national issues, and then says, OK, that's a little too broad. That's a little too vague. Let's try to really set down what we think are the most important powers Congress should have. And so we see in the Committee of Detail something that then ends up growing into what we now have is Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is where we list the powers of Congress. And, you know, as you look at those powers, you can see why the delegates reach the conclusion that we need a Congress in those situations. The first, these are some of the most important ones, the power to collect taxes. This is correcting what they saw as a defect in the Articles of Confederation, the government that came before. The national government didn't have the power to tax. It couldn't fund the government. It couldn't fund the army. They wanted the new Congress to have that power. It granted Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. We saw prior to the Constitutional Convention, states often competing economically rather than having a, a cooperative common market. And so they decide, the delegates decide, we really would like Congress to have some say over how the national economy is going to work. We gave Congress the power to declare war. And so we, in the, with the national government, we say, we want the national government to speak, we want the nation to speak with a single voice 
on the world stage. And so in part, that's what they're doing with Congress's powers there. And then finally, we see again, the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. And so it's giving, to providing some play in the joints, giving Congress some flexibility. It can't state literally everything Congress is going to do in Article 1, Section 8. The Constitution wouldn't look like this. It would look like this. <laughs> and so the, instead, they put a necessary and proper clause in there saying that Congress could do certain things that are necessary to carry out the various powers that we have listed there. Finally, if you're looking for limitations on the powers of government, you would look at Article 1, Section 9 for certain limits on Congress's powers. And then in Article 1, Section 10, we have certain limits on the states, certain things that we say we don't want the states to do, including entering treaties with foreign nations. Again, we want a single national foreign policy and then coining their own money or impairing contracts. So that's, again, this idea that there are certain ways in which we want the, the national government to set national standards when it comes to the economy. And then finally, we see the Article 6's supremacy clause, which basically tells us that when Congress passes a law and it's valid and it's constitutional, it's more, it, it, it's more powerful than state laws, that the national law is supreme. Um, it, it's so helpful on that note and kind of that idea. And I know that the years moving forward help kind of define the debate. So again, as always, they lay the groundwork during this constitutional convention. Um, the chat is also discussing what they, they didn't get to because they spent so much time on Congress. Um, but even, you know, spending a ton of time on Congress, it wasn't perfect. And there's debate today about things we might change about the structure of Congress. Our Friday scholar last week brought up a few ideas that he thought should be changed about Congress. But as we kind of look at this town, we have about like Nine minutes left, and we can look at the founding era. I know you love Civil War, the Lochner era, the New Deal, but I really do want to think about the role of Congress today in setting national policy. So I was thinking maybe jump to the hypothetical, get our students thinking about it, and then jump to maybe a few examples that can help support how do we figure out what the answer is. How does that sound? <laughs> Sounds great, Curry. Awesome. Okay, so here's the hypothetical to everybody. And students, feel free, if you wanna put it, what you think in the chat, feel free to put it in the chat. But the hypothetical is, does Congress have the power to pass a law requiring everybody to wear a mask during the pandemic? So Congress saying national law, everybody must wear a mask during the pandemic. And so Tom, you taught us in the beginning of this class to look for the power in the constitution that Congress has. So where, if we want this, say we're on the side of this law and we want this law because you play both sides right we want this law to be passed we're writing this law where are we going to cite power for this law and then say we're on the other side and we don't want this law where are we going to say the limits for congress are on this so walk us through it connect this and i'll jump around wherever you go <laughs> okay so can i can, can we maybe do it by like just ticking through the different historical periods i'll do them very quickly to place yeah. them on the table and then we'll get back to the hypo does that sound good Yep, and our students keep answering in there. Go for it. All right, perfect. So now, you know, if we're looking at these are things that end up the, 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 the powers of Congress are debated throughout American history. And so just to tick through sort of how this developed over time, I'll say a little bit about each of these periods, but not drill down too deeply. So first, if we're looking for the first period from the founding up to the Civil War, a lot of the debates over the powers of Congress at the Supreme Court are settled by the period of the Marshall Court from 1801 to 1835. And so what a lot of these cases are addressed, they're addressing two big powers in the Constitution, the Commerce Power under Article I, Section 8, and the Necessary and Proper Clause under Article I, Section 8. And so during this period, we have a bunch of really big landmark cases. Two of the big ones are McCullough v. Maryland, where the Supreme Court uh, effectively says that the a National Bank of the United States, though there is no specific charter bank clause in the Constitution, that a bank of the United States is constitutional. So reading Congress's powers under commerce and especially the necessary and proper clause fairly broadly. And in Gibbons versus Ogden, they offer again, sort of a broad reading of the commerce power under article one, section eight. The big idea here is that over and over the Marshall Court would confirm that Congress was only an, it was an institution of limited powers. So the constitution did limit the powers of Congress. Nevertheless, the Marshall Court tended to read the powers of Congress, particularly the commerce power and the necessary, is necessary and proper clause fairly broadly, mostly to the purpose of allowing Congress to have some power to shape the development of the American economy as it, was a, as it went from being a new nation to a much more powerful nation by the time we get to the Civil War in the late 1800s. The next period, Curry, and I'm gonna spend only a second on it, is the Civil War and Reconstruction 
The big idea here is this is the period after the Civil War. We ratify a series of three transformational amendments, one that abolished slavery, the 13th Amendment, one that promised freedom and equality, which is the 14th Amendment, and one that banned racial discrimination in voting. That's the 15th Amendment. The thing to pull out from here is that these amendments are the first amendments that actually grant the national government, grant Congress more power because each of these amendments included what's called an enforcement clause, which give Congress the power to carry out the commands in those amendments. That's not to say that this settles national power for all time. We, ever since then, we've continued to debate both the scope of Congress's power and how much power is left to the states even after these amendments are ratified. So that's the Civil War and Reconstruction. I'm sorry, Carrie, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Just to kind of like nail that a little bit, uh, uh, amplify it a little bit. So during these three amendments, Congress gets more power than what was defined in the original constitution. And that's one of the reasons why some scholars say this is like a second founding, a reset because more power shifts between the branches of government and more power is given. So it's a really big time period students, if you haven't studied it, it's super interesting time period. Okay, now diving in, you wanna to go to Lochner era is where I think you're jumping. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do 30 seconds on the Lochner era maybe, and then we'll get to the new deal. So then we have this period, it's the, it's, the, it's the Gilded Age, it's the Progressive Era. Constitutional scholars call it the Lochner Era after this case, Lochner versus New York, where the Supreme Court struck down a New York law that regulated the working conditions of bakers. But it's an exciting period for both policy and constitutional law. Because what we have is the country is changing massively during this period in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. We see big changes to the economy. We see big railroads, big businesses, you know, sort of new dangers for workers. At the same time, we see governments at all levels, Congress, state governments, local governments doing more than ever before. And so we have more laws on the books than ever before. And so we have certain supporters of government action saying there are new dangers in society. We need laws to address them. But then we also have defenders of the traditional view of a limited government at the national level saying, no, 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 some of these laws go too far. And so what the Lochner era does is during this period, in the face of all of these big laws, the court responds by trimming back a bit on the powers of Congress. So it, it is certainly the case that the Supreme Court would uphold far more, far more laws than they would declare unconstitutional, but it's the Supreme Court really working to enforce a vision of a national government of limited powers and try to draw the line between what are the sorts of things that the national government should do and what sorts of things should be left to the states. So that's the Lochner era, Curry. We see it completely overturned by FDR and the New Deal. And so during that period, what we end up seeing is this, we see the Great Depression, we see Congress and the national government doing more than ever before to regulate the economy. We see big programs, some that we even still have today, like Social Security, passed during this period. And so there's an initial wave at the Supreme Court of decisions that strike down FDR's laws, say that they're unconstitutional, say that features of the New Deal are unconstitutional. But beginning in 1937, the Supreme Court reverses course. Some scholars say it's because FDR threatened to pack the court with new justices. So to put new justices on the Supreme Court and therefore force the Supreme Court to declare his laws, uh, his, his, new laws on, uh, his new laws constitutional. But nevertheless, the Supreme Court decides to turn away from the Lochner era and then read the commerce power quite broadly and read the necessary and proper clause quite broadly. And so read the constitution in a way that allows the national government to do a great deal to regulate the economy. Awesome. And so Giro asked an interesting question in the chat that as we kind of dive into the New Deal and more laws, does more laws always equate to more power by the government? Or is that's not always a one-to-one -one connection? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I did the same thing. I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, I suppose you could have certain laws that put processes in place to limit power. I mean, there's certainly, if people are skeptical of national power, you could pass new rules that can make, say, lawmaking more difficult. Certainly, policymaking at the national level can sometimes take away powers of the state and local governments. And so sometimes it's about where political power is going. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. So we'll ponder that as we go through class, but uh, that's a good question in there. So as we jump into the New Deal, do you want to jump into uh, uh, Wicker v. Fillmore, or do you want to jump back to the hypothetical? Because we have like a couple minutes left. Uh, let's quickly do Wicker, and then we'll do the hypothetical. Does that sound good, Curry? Okay. So yeah, the, the height of yeah, so the height of the New Deal's power is seen in this case, Wickard v. Filburn, which is 1942. And so here, the court uh, rejected a challenge to the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938. This is a law that limited the amount of wheat 
farmers can grow on their own farms. And so who is Philburn? It's Roscoe Philburn. He's a small farmer. He's, he's basically just growing wheat to feed his animals on his own farm. He's not selling it at interstate commerce. He's not selling it to anyone. And so he looks at this broad law passed by Congress and says, this goes way beyond the power that Congress has. In what way is the wheat that I'm feeding my animals in any way affecting interstate commerce? That can't be right. There must be limits on Congress's power in this case. And the Supreme Court says no. In a unanimous decision, it says, Roscoe Filburn, you're wrong. It upholds the Agricultural Adjustment Act as constitutional, and it reads the powers of commerce really, really, really broadly. The argument there is that, okay, sure, Mr. Filburn, you aren't selling your wheat on the market, but nevertheless, what you are doing is you're using your own wheat, so therefore you're not buying wheat from the open market, and then if everyone did the same thing you're doing, Mr. Filburn, it would disrupt the inter interstate market for wheat, so Congress can intervene in this really broad way. It's an amazing revolution in the powers that Congress has under the Constitution, and now we would see from 1942 all the way until 1995, Congress, uh, the Supreme Court would not strike down any law passed by Congress as exceeding its commerce power. The Supreme Court basically just uphold everything Congress did from 1942 until 1995. And then from 1995 onward, Curry, the last note is that the Supreme Court began to try to figure out, are there ways in which we could trim back on some of these powers we granted to Congress? Are there certain ways that we could curb sort of the, the, the broadest reading of cases like Wickard v. Filburn? And so we see debates from 1995 onward, everything from the, the power of the national government to address gun violence to the Affordable Care Act and health care. These debates often are turning on, do we give power, does this power go to the national government? Does it go to the states? Or is it something that the two share? And that's a great, a perfect roll into our hypothetical. And, and the students are kind of like mind, trying to wrap their minds around Wicker v. Filborn, but that's why I like this case, because sometimes it is a hard one to wrap your mind around. It seems a really huge and expansive that the laws could be under. But now you're saying that the court is saying, whose job is it? So when we look at this hypothetical, is that the same question we should be asking? So it should Congress make a national law on this or whose job is it and where's the power? So help us kind of, you know, we don't have this in place. So we don't know how it would play out right now. But as a constitutional lawyer and our, you know, budding constitutional lawyers in the chat, how should they break it down to see how to strengthen it or how to weaken it on either side of the issue? Absolutely. So Curry, this is one thing to notice, like this is the sort of question that if we were just dealing with a state law, it would be a much easier question because these are the sorts of things where states have really, really broad powers to pass laws to promote, promote the health, safety and welfare of their residents. And the Supreme Court has confirmed this in cases like Massachusetts versus Jacobson in uh, 1905. So as to the states, it would be, a, 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 you know, every question could be debated, but it would be the states have, uh, you know, very broad powers in this context. But as we turn to Congress, Congress is, it has limited power. And so we always have to ask that first question, Congress, where do you get this power from? Where can we look at our constitution and find powers that might justify a law like this? So if I'm Congress or if I'm Congress's lawyers, there are really three sources of power that I'm looking to and arguing that this is consistent with. One, not surprisingly, we've talked about it a lot during this session, is the Commerce Clause. And so the commerce power of Congress, which has been read broadly over time. The second is the spending power of Congress. So this is the idea that Congress can pass certain laws, giving the states money, but then requiring the states to do something in return. In return. So that's sort of the spending power. And the last one is the necessary and proper clause. So if we're looking at this, this a broad mask mandate like this, we're going to ask some, some really big questions. So one is going to be, you know, if, if it's a really, really broad mask mandate applying to everyone everywhere, Congress is going to end up being susceptible to, you know, greater challenges. Um, whereas if Congress really does tailor a mask mandate like this to businesses, to things that are relating to the economy, to when people go to work or people go to stores. And so trying to tailor it in such a way that it's connecting more directly with something like the Commerce Clause power, they'd be in a relatively stronger position. But sort of under each of these powers, there would be important arguments from both the supporters and also the challengers. Of course, Congress has not passed a law like this, Curry, so we don't know exactly how it would come down. But I would say if I were Congress's lawyers and, say, and saying, Congress, you wanna pass something that, that passes constitutional muster that states are gonna uphold, you would wanna rely on the Commerce Clause power and tailor that mask mandate to something in the economy. So businesses, people going to work or people going to stores or something like that. 
You might use the spending power where the Supreme Court has recognized a broad spending power where Congress could pass a law saying there's a certain amount of federal money that goes to the states that uh, will then, uh, if they pass something like a mask mandate, so Congress using the spending power as kind of both a carrot and a stick to try to get mm. states to do what Congress wants. And then finally, you would probably still make some arguments under the Necessary and Proper Clause, but importantly, that's not an independent source of power. You would still need to find some other part of the Constitution justifying the exercise of power by Congress. Um, but it, it, in the end, I think the constitutionality of something like this is gonna turn a bit on, or it, it, the strength of the argument for Congress is gonna turn a bit on how broad versus how narrow the mandate is, whether it's time limited in certain ways. So is it just for all times? Or is it just for a set period of time? And are there any sort of triggers in place that seem to tailor it well to the problem? So maybe a mass mandate in certain areas for certain places, if there's a high test positivity rate there or something like that. So various ways in which Congress could tailor it and make it less broad will make it less susceptible to constitutional challenge. Tom, that's so helpful. And I love this idea as we talk about these big constitutional questions of our time, of the past that we're always looking for these base things. Where does that part of the government have power in the constitution? And then this really fun game we played at the end is be a constitutional lawyer for the side or for the other side and try to figure out how you would bolster the argument or weaken the argument, how you would write the law better or you know counteract a law that came through and say, this is why it's not up to favorite line of the day, the constitutional muster. So I absolutely love that um, really great kind of techniques and ways that our students can look at the constitution and the questions of our time. And also, you know, in understanding that a role of the people is to make sure that our people in Congress are doing what we want. And that means following the constitution. So thank you so much. This was really helpful. Great questions, everybody in the chat. And thanks for sharing ideas as well. And thank you very much, Tom. Thank you students.